Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining me on this Care Collab together with Lynn Smith today to discuss our Dendrobium unicums, the unique Dendrobium. Pretty much probably because of the shape of the flowers. Road trip, road trip first. We're going to the northern part of Thailand today to find out where the Dendrobium unicum is found in its natural habitat and that would be at 800 to 1,000 meters in the northern part of Thailand near Om Khoi. And a little bit more northeastern, it will be found at 1,400 to 1,500 meters near the area of Loe. I hope I'm saying those names correctly, but not only there, we can also move a little bit further to Laos where we can find it in the area of Betiane and then a little bit more further south in Zedone. Now, I have the Vietnam form. It is one of the most popular forms and it is a windy day today, my apologies. It is the most popular form because of its larger bloom size. In, the, in Vietnam, you can find it like in Eastern Vietnam, always at altitude. However, I have not been able to locate the exact pin position of where its natural habitat is in Vietnam. So there's different forms of Dendrobium unicum. This one being Vietnam form, very coveted because of the larger blooms and very, very popular. Personally, I don't find this a very hard orchid to grow, even though you can see that mine is definitely nothing to write home about size wise. The cane is not even 20 centimeters long. It can be double the size easily if it's treated correctly and once it comes out of a seedling stage. But they do bloom very, very early in their development, so it's not like you have to wait a long time. And I did have blooms from it last year, and I only just got it last year, and it promptly bloomed even on a snapped cane. So it's very robust. It can take some abuse. And in my climate here in southern Spain, I am actually able to cultivate it outdoors all year round, which is perfect because then I hardly need to move it. I have it in my blooming alley on the back wall of the grid facing south. And then the angle of the sun does the work for me because in the winter when the sun is lower in the sky, it hits the orchid directly. And in the summer when the sun is higher in the sky, the orchid is in full shade during the hottest part of the month. My winter temperatures can go down to five degrees Celsius and I have it usually about a humidity in the winter averaging 65, 70%. But it is the summers that get extremely hot, which means that it needs a lot, a lot of misting, especially being on a mount like this. I do not have any organic material around this mount. It can also be grown called the moss orchid because of it grows in moss, but it also grows in rocks. So you can see how versatile it is in its culture. In my case, I'm trying to get away from anything organic, including mounts. So this has been on this mount not just quite a year. I mounted it in the summer of last year, but I have to spray a lot in order to keep up with the humidity and its watering needs. The roots that you see are all pretty old roots. They still do their job to some degree, but not as much as I would like to. And I have added a second little cushion in the back. This is kitchen hob extractor fan material, filter, that kind of stuff. So I'm using this as a substitute to moss and I'm hoping that its high water retention qualities will also give me the opportunity to have a little bit more humidity around the root ball when my dry summers come. The big, big test will be this summer because I have a new growth coming right here. And that is going to be my test to see how this orchid will be able to handle my conditions and if I can keep up with its watering needs as it grows, because that is when the time comes to really give the orchid some substance with regards to fertilizer. At this moment, and I'm talking about spring, I am not seeing clearly any roots, but I've got buds that I do want to have grow well and not blast. And I want them to bloom and I want them to last. Oh, that rhymed. <laughs> so 
So I am fertilizing at this moment at 160 parts per million and being on an inorganic mount, I'm going at a pH of 6.3 to find a little bit of a balance between all the nutrients and what is the best absorption rate within that pH range. So that is what I'm doing now every day, once a day in the morning. And then because we are getting warm and warmer temperatures and there is a lot of breeze going that dries everything out relatively quickly, I am going in after several hours and just watering one more time with plain RO water. If need be, I will also go in a third time during the day, maybe late afternoon at around 5, 6 p.m. and water one more time because depending on the breeze, depending on the temperature, depending on the low humidity, I want to make sure that the orchid has until about 8 p.m. to dry out. Our temperatures are currently such that by the evening, everything is dried out. And when I say evening, I'm saying 8 p.m. So another spritz at 5 p.m. is absolutely okay in my climate. I want to avoid desiccating this cane right here. This one has not desiccated completely, but being an orchid that at this moment only has two viable storage organs and has weak roots, I need to make 100% sure that this growth won't fail. This is its future and I need the roots from that. So a lot of watering at this point in time. And if, if I see that there's any sign of desiccation and shriveling of this cane, which is now plump and shiny, as the orchid starts to bloom and progresses and opens the blooms, I'm going to be nipping the buds off because I want to make sure that the strength goes into the new growth and then we can look forward to these blooms next year and I say that with such confidence because this orchid really is very very forgiving I have not had any problems with it I was extremely disappointed to get a snapped cane which was the cane that you know would have given it all the substance I didn't cut the cane off at the time just wondering to see what would happen and it bloomed despite being snapped at the base. I did take the cane off eventually because I just thought, right, I've had enough of this experimentation. It was making me a little bit nervous. And true to form, as dendrobiums are so resilient, this little guy, for me, out of literally nowhere, is actually starting a new growth, which makes me very, very happy. One day, maybe, it'll be big enough so that I can give it its maximum, maximum fertilizer that I would dare to put into my collection based on the temperatures, and that is 300 parts per million. But in the winter, because it lives outside, I do not stop watering it. I am always misting, even with plain RO water, this mount throughout the winter. My orchids outside do not get a dry winter rest, and I believe that it is the temperature drop that induces blooming as opposed to not administering any, any water. So I do water mine throughout every day, 365 days a year. If, for example, I have a rainy day, I will then put the mount out and expose it to the rain as well. And I don't care if it's mid-December and my temperatures are only 17 degrees during the day and get cold at night. I'm absolutely fine and confident this orchid is so hardy and resilient that it is actually an easy, easy grower, in my opinion. And if you don't have the opportunity, for example, to have it on a mount, it would easily work as well, potted up, seeing as it's never gonna become one of those massive, lanky, dangling dendrobiums. It's a compact miniature grower to my understanding, the blooms are not fragrant, but to have this one potted up as a last resort, if, for example, the orchid gets so big in my environment and under my care, that in a couple of years, this method, this setup doesn't work, I won't have a problem putting it into a pot with small lava rock in a semi-hydro setup and growing it on the shelf all year round. 
So unfortunately, I have really, really delayed filming this video because I wanted mine to be in bloom for this care collab. But as you can see, those orange candy-like looking buds, yeah, one is starting to open. But that is what I like about these care collabs, seeing the same orchid in different climates, environments, and grow methods, how they respond at the same time during the seasons. I, that's what I like. So I, yes, I want my orchid to be in bloom. That would have been nice, but it is what it is. And the video from Lynn Smith has a completely different setup and growing environment. And I think hers is actually in bloom. And it just goes to show how our temperatures can vary. Our cultures pretty much could be similar, but the orchids will react and respond differently based on what they're exposed to. In my case, outdoors all the time. My temperatures are rising naturally and not, you know, I don't have a controlled environment and the orchid reacts according to where it's at. So yes, I'm really excited to see the blooms on Lynn Smith's video. I encourage you to go down, the link will be in the description and have a look, see what she does with hers and how much more mature her Dendrobium unicum is. In my case, I am excited for what's to come. I'm so happy to see my new growth and how the roots will develop. That is going to be, for me, the proper starting phase of my unicum and myself, because again, last year it was new to my collection and all this other influences with a snapped cane. Resilient, pretty, large blooms for this kind of a dendrobium and stunning, stunning orange color. The sepals and petals, they curl back. The lip sticks out like a massive tongue. Has beautiful markings along the lip. Very, very unique, as the name actually says. I really hope that you found this quick care collab that we put together, it was like a blitz thing, interesting, and that you go over and check out Lynn Smith's video. If you have any questions with regards to my mount and what is going on here if you have not seen the videos of the evolution i have a playlist which i will link in the description and it was all due to the inspiration of michael mccarthy when i was concerned about something that might might not happen in my collection and he said how about epiweb yes well epiweb is extremely expensive then he said how about a scrubby pad the rest is history and you can follow the process and the evolution along in my playlist, the evolution of inorganic mounts. So thank you very much for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Please, please stay safe. We will see my blooms in future videos for sure. I'm going to be happy to share them with you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.